Hi, my name is Jim Janessy. This is a page lecture for page 9 of the History of Visual Technology, a workbook that I authored in 2012. We talk about light in terms of its color temperature as a way of indicating generally what kind of a color or hue of light is emitted by the light source. In this illustration on page 9, you see three different light sources, the common light bulb, a fluorescent lamp, and a second form of fluorescent lamp. On this page, what we're going to do is talk about the effect of these different light sources on colors as they're perceived. And I think you'll see that the light that's used to illuminate an artwork has a great deal to do with the way that we view that artwork. Here's an expansion of the illustration on page 9. Let's first take a look at a common incandescent light bulb. This is the kind of a light source that was invented by Thomas Edison in the late 1800s. It's basically a wire that's suspended in a vacuum or in an inert gas environment, one that doesn't contain oxygen, and the wire is heated by passing an electric current through it. As the current passes through the wire, it agitates the molecules in the wire, and that agitation results in heat. And as that filament gets hotter and hotter, it first glows red, and then it goes essentially up this scale to a certain point. For our purposes, the measure of temperature on the Kelvin scale really doesn't matter too much. What we're concerned about is the color of the light that's being emitted by this light source. And here we have the red arrow pointing to where on that scale from orange to yellow to white to blue the incandescent light falls, you'll see that it's fairly low in the scheme of things and it produces kind of a yellowish glow, kind of a, a cozy glow. And we've pretty much become accustomed to that for artificial light sources because light bulbs were the light source used for over a hundred years. However, with concerns for energy efficiency, other forms of light producing bulbs are now being created. One of these is a common fluorescent lamp adapted to a socket that fits the same socket that a light bulb would fit. This is actually an adaptation of fluorescent tubes as you might have seen them in libraries and institutions and other types of commercial stores. This produces light by having an electric current flow through an ionizable gas and the agitation of those molecules causes a phosphorescent coating on the inside of the glass to glow. So it's kind of an indirect way to produce light from electricity. There's two steps going on there. We agitate the electrons and they agitate this thing that glows. The kind of light this puts out is of a different color. You'll see the arrow that exists on the slide is higher up on the scale now, tending more towards a cold white or even a bluish color. And an even more modern fluorescent lamp might produce an even cooler color. Cooler being up the scale, which is kind of counterintuitive, the numbers are going up, we would think the temperature goes up, and in fact the temperature does go up, but the color actually goes from orange, which we consider to be a warm color, to white and then blue, which we consider to be cool colors. Now what is the relevance of all this to what we're taking a look at? Well think about this, remember back the cartoon you saw earlier where the sun was illuminating an object and the light that the object reflected was the color that we associated with the object. Sunlight is kind of the gold standard. If you can get to the sun on a day that's not cloudy, we tend to think that the color that we see objects is the actual color of the object. But what if the light source doesn't have the same composition of colors to offer as sunlight does? And that's really the situation with each of these three forms of artificial illumination. So the cooler the light source, the more it tends towards the white or the blue, the cooler the object that we're looking at might appear. Colors that look one way under an incandescent lamp would look different under a fluorescent lamp. Now keep in mind what's going on here. At the low end of the scale we see the candle flame or the match flame. Think about the Lascaux caves. The people who created the artworks in those dark caves gathered the colorants on the surface of the earth. With sunlight showing the colorants would look a certain way. But then when they carried them down underground, what was the source of illumination? It was some type of a torch, some type of a burning substance, which probably approximates the kind of color being produced by a candle flame or a match flame, definitely down on the orange end of things. This would create what we would associate with a warmer sort of a, an environment. 
they probably didn't realize what was happening, that the color of the object depended on the type of light that was being used to illuminate it, and what they were carrying down there in terms of torches produced a different color, a different range of colors, different range of light frequencies to reflect off the object. So the colors may have looked different. What probably happened and lent kind of a magical air to what was happening in the caves was that things that looked one way on the surface looked different underground. Maybe they thought that these places were responsible for the objects looking differently. And then the flickering light and the shadows that would be cast on paintings that were painted on rock outcroppings could tend to make them look kind of animated. Magic may well have been one of the kinds of feelings that they got from these caves. Let's talk about one other aspect of illumination of artworks. It doesn't have anything to do with color temperature, but it has to do with the effect of light on the substances that are used as colorants. For many, many years, from ancient times onward, people noticed that the sun changed the color of things. If you dyed a piece of cloth with some sort of a plant root, some liquid made from it, it changed color as time went on. But for clothing, that doesn't matter very much because clothing is going to wear out. The illustration you see on this page shows what happened as substances that faded with light falling upon them were used to paint with. The ancients and throughout the Middle Ages, by experimentation, artists learned what substances were light fast. For example, a blue made from lapis lazuli, which is a gemstone that's ground up into a powder, that's not going to change color, no matter how much light falls on it, because it's sort of locked in the stone. That is the color of the stone, and it doesn't get bleached out by sun. But in the 1800s, when chemists were experimenting with synthetic dyes and synthetic pigments, Many times what happened was artists would start using these and it was only later discovered that they really weren't very light fast. They faded. The coloring was fugitive. And what you see here is an example of that. This is a picture painted perhaps in the 1800s. It was originally framed with a, a heavy wooden frame that covered up what you see as the outer band. That was covered by a wooden frame that blocked light. However, ordinary light, just this painting hanging on the wall, perhaps not in the sun, but just exposed to light, for let's say a century, the light affected those pigments and faded them as you see here. Now when we remove the frame, we see what the original coloring was that the artist saw, and we can see that the artwork has changed significantly. This is different than the kind of change that occurs with older artworks that were painted with colorants that would not have faded as much, which tended to become obscured by layers of varnish applied to them or grime from burning materials to produce light, like in churches. Those kinds of artworks can be conserved. They can be restored. The layers of varnish and grime can be removed from the surface, as was done with paintings in the Sistine Chapel over the last 30 years, and is commonly done with artworks that have been hanging in places that are not very controlled environments, some older museums, for example. You can't correct this type of fading, however, with that sort of a process, because the change in the colors here is not due to the fact that some obscuring layer exists. It's due to the actual changes in the substance itself that was used for painting. This is a much more complex process. There is a very interesting website that I've put on the slide at the end of this series. If you want to pursue the idea of how restoration can be done when light has affected pigments and they faded as you see here on this slide. Take a look farther on and investigate the website that I refer you to there where a very very interesting way of restoring the original appearance of a painting has been undertaken by way of the light that is used to illuminate it. It's a very very interesting way that these two subjects of fading and color temperature tie together in the world of art.